This week on The Laura Flanders Show, Native Hearts and Pleasure. We go in-depth with two feminist authors and a feminist bookstore. First, to Barnard College for a talk with Chicana activist and author Cherie Moraga about her first book release in eight years. Then, a unique kind of activism from Adrienne Marie Brown, whose latest best-selling book is an examination of activist pleasure. All that and a landmark feminist bookstore turns 20 years old. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show. So just how far back do we have to go for a reclamation of ourselves? That's really the question at the heart of a new book by Cherie Moraga, Native Country of the Heart. You know Cherie, though, most likely, as the co-editor with Gloria Anzaldúa of this classic book, This Bridge Called My Back. If you've heard reference to Audre Lorde's Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House speech. It was first published in this book. It's a classic, as is this one, Loving in the War Years, Cherie's Book of Poetry, which came out, if I'm right, in 1983. Cherie is here at Barnard College in New York receiving the college's highest honor, its Medal of Distinction. I'm thrilled to have a chance to talk with you, Cherie. We've never met, but I feel as if we did. Yes, yes, I feel the same way. So I, get a ch I assume you get a chance to make some comments today? Uh, yeah, earlier in the day, I'll make some comments. What do you think is important for the students of this year to hear from you, Cherie? Oh, well, I think that, in part, I think one of the reasons, I, I would imagine one of the reasons, I'd like to think this, of getting this award has everything to do with you know, the fact of the specificity um, the ethnic and racial specificity and of my work, you know, as a Chicana, and also I'm a queer woman, I, and I have been out about those things for 40 years, and uh, you know, at least 35 years of publishing. And the effort, I think, is to respond to what's happening politically in the United States now. The kind of you know incredible, you know, anti, specifically anti-Mexican rhetoric, you know, where suddenly we're all lumped into um, a lie, you know, that's not true for those of us that have been here from the beginning of time as indigenous people here, and also uh, very recent immigrants, you know. So I, you know, I think what, what I would, what I want to do, or just kind of show by my virtual presence is that, you know, we are the complexity of all that experience. And I, and I thank uh, Barnard, uh, if that was the rationale for the, uh, you know, for the selection, I'm honored to have it. In the 1980s, when you were involved in the publishing of these books. Where did you imagine we would be by now? I know I had thoughts. I was coming up in the same period. I didn't predict this. Oh, no, my God. You know, I think for me, you know, I graduated from college in 1974, right? So I'm a, I'm a little bit ahead of you, right? And I think to, to, you know, coming of age, like you're 16, it's 1968, it's like you just imagine the world was just, it, the future meant progression. The future meant liberation. The future meant that every little, you know, this is after, you know, the emergence of the civil rights movements, all the people of color movements, then came the, you know, the uh, feminist movement, then the lesbian and gay movement. It's just, you know, let's just break it down, you know, continue in this way. I think I never anticipated such, uh, you know, a bona fide, uh, legitimized hatred. And all one can hope and think is that because it is so radically wrong, you know, that there is an, an emergence of a, a radical response to it. So why a book of history now? Why, why a memoir and particularly a, a recalling of your mother? Um, well, this is the second memoir that I've done. And the, the first one, um, Waiting, Waiting in the Wings, A Portrait of a Queer Motherhood, came out of a very specific situation. And that situation was um, at 40, I gave birth to my son. And, and uh, he was born very premature. And, you know, the, at one point, his, you know, he's fine now, I can say that, but at, at one point, very early on, his life was very threatened. 
And it took me on sort of a three-year journey of having to sort of deal with the fact that, you know, that I was the only, the first and only time I was pregnant, and you know, I was gave birth, and then suddenly there was a possibility of losing him very quickly. And that became sort of that memoir had a very specific approach, which was a question about, you know, why we're here on this planet, you know, and we're here long or short, but what are you going to do with your life? I mean, that that question put me on a whole road about leaving the relationship I was in, and making a renewed commitment to my own political activism, but also questions of, you know, what, what, is your, what is your proposito, your purpose in life? And I thank my son for that. So that was one in mind. I've written, you know, collections of essays since, and, and, they're, and they, are, they tend to be somewhat topical, right? Like a, responding to a question I might have politically. And there's always a personal relationship. I think that's what I learned from feminism more than anything else, about the personal is political, and the political is personal. With, uh, with the, my mother um, contracted um, Alzheimer's, when that began to happen, she was the family guentista, our storyteller. She was really the matriarch of the family. And, you know, in 1977, I wrote a poem, you know, what kind of lover have you made me, mother? And the second poem was for the color of my mother. And, you know, I'm mixed race. And I, you know, was raised in a completely Mexicano family. But here I am, huerita, you know, in, in color. And so that formational stuff around coming out as a lesbian within the context of Chicanidad was, is 35 years old, if not older. So with my mother's passing and, 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 all, and all of my, her siblings passed at the same time, Suddenly, the book came to me is that it wasn't just in the question of my mother's intimate amnesia, which was very hard to see her lose her stories, but also the question of cultural amnesia, you know, among, among Mexican Americans in the United States, and, and also the questions of the, you know, the land that was underneath our house two blocks away from the mission, which is, you know, Tongva land. You know, these were not, um, these are not rhetorical questions. These are really something viscerally I remember as a child and I, I had to return to. You have a great line in the book where you say you wonder whether your mother was demented or just Mexican in the world. I think that's a large question about just, you know, the a response to the monoculturalism of the United States. I mean, it's like you just, when you're raised, you know, within, if you're raised in a culture that, you know, is not the mainstream culture, you're raised with a set of values, you're raised to, ways of looking at, at what's important in the world, why you wake up every morning. Uh, you know, you think about the values of uh, the general notion of what we're supposed to want as Americans, which is competition, which is always looking to the future, never look back, you know, build, 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 construct, make more, do that, you know. And, and when you, so when you're raised in a culture that, that counters that sort of on a daily basis, which is you also belong to a people, and not that there isn't something to critique in all of those things, which is certainly as a, as a young lesbian, I had to do that, right? It's almost like it is, you know, that double consciousness, you know, that we've talked about for so long that, that and, and you, you realize, particularly when I saw that my mother returned since uh, uh, short-term memory goes first, long-term memory lasts. She began to speak completely in Spanish in her last years because that's her original language, right? And also those ways of being history, old resentments, old clarities. And that's why in the book when she said, you know, that one like, yes, I'm Indian too. It's like, you know, this is, uh, you know, forbidden almost among many Mexicans in terms of denial of their in indigenous heritage, right? So that's what I mean. Is that dementia or is that illumination, right? And I think that I always hope that people, you know, because you know, so many families are dealing with this in their own, you know, in their own lives, is that to, to really listen to what some people think is crazy. Your vision in 81, you've talked a little bit about visions, but specifically the bridge. What bridge were you talking about, and what's the state of that bridge today? I'm not sure, you know. I think that, that we were specifically in 1981, Gloria Ansaldu and I initially, our idea for the book in 79 was really to respond to white feminism. You know, that we had both been involved in the, in the movement, the early stages of the movement, and, and that we, Probably some of the strongest lessons I learned about race and class came from the white women's movement of experiencing incredibly inbred classism and racism. And that radicalized me tremendously. But the book ended up being, that was just like one chapter, the racism of the white women's movement. The rest really became about relations among women of color and across culture, across class, across immigration status, I mean, all of this. 
And I think that, you know, it's always that Kambahi River Collective statement that made it, you know, so clear to me that if black women weren't free, you know, nobody else is going to be free because, you know, black women, you know, were, were on this bottom cycle of oppression, right? Meaning internationally. So now I look at a resurgence of a, of a feminist movement. People are reading the Kambahi River Collective again. Right, right. I mean, so there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of growing consciousness, absolutely. I think I still have some of the same critiques. I always have trouble even saying Trump's name, but Trump's election, and you're looking at, I'm still, and I'm, you know, various cities, and you're still seeing, yes, there's a women of color leadership happening in there, but it's not, it's not, it's really still, the vision is still single-issued. There still is a fundamental thing going on that has to do, that it comes out of, middle class and, and, and white feminism. But don't people talk a lot about intersectionality? Well, they talk a lot about it, yeah. But I think the living practice of it is different because what happens is that it's like you walk into a situation, I think there's, it's still about, oh, if we have people of color in the room, then we're good. But then you look at who are the people of color. Like right now I'm talking in translation. You know what I'm saying? Like I've learned very well how to talk to lots of different kinds of people, lots of different classes, et cetera. But when people don't know the translating tongue, right? You're not really allowed in the room. And that's an issue of class, you know, really. So, so one thing is to have, you know, upper middle class or middle class people, and not that there isn't racism in those inter interactions. But the real question is, you know, is there really allowance for more than one language for liberation, you know, among women, right? And, and to what degree do class biases and race biases still, and cultural biases still inform our understanding of liberation for women. So coming to place and to the themes that we think about a lot on our show, yes, there's a lot of pain in history, in each of our histories, some more than others, it's not all the same. But there's something else there too, and you bring that very strongly in your book. Um, so talk a little bit about that and how going back to that history has fed you as well as reminded you of some of the more painful legacies. You know, some people have asked me, was the book healing for me in writing Maybe it? That's you know. a shorter way of putting it. Well, and I, <laughs> and I say, well, no. I said, it was already feeling healed that I could write it. You know, and I think that's the point. I think there, you know, I talk a lot about my mother's intractability. I, the, you know, she, she could be very violent. And uh, people will say, oh, that was a side of trauma. You know, I don't use those words, right? And partly I don't use them as a writer because I feel like they can blanket. Sometimes they open, and this is what we need to understand, is the difference between language that opens us, and once it kind of blankets it conveniently, like a word like allies, you know? Like, so sometimes, you know, I hear my students say they're allies, right? And you kind of go, well, yes, but, you know, why don't you go home and look at your own stuff before you decide you're going to be an ally, you know? And <clears throat> I think that's the point of the, of the book very much, is that my sense that, that we can't really be fully effective in the world unless we go home. You have to look at what formed you good and bad. And this is, goes from the poorest to the richest, you know, that you really, I mean, I, I always, I teach writing this way. I always tell my students they have to go home and the kids of color are going to do that. And the white kids think they don't have to. And I go, oh, no, no, especially you. You guys got to go home. We need you to go home. Figure that out, you know. And then, there's the, then the we becomes much more grounded. It's not a, a superficial we that will break the first time there's a contradiction. Right? We need to live in paradox and contradiction. That's what we have in front of us. Coyote crossing. It's when you least expect it. El coyote leaps out of the snarl of blackberry bush and flashes across the roadway. You nearly hit him, but then he gets away with it, meat between his teeth, and you wonder if you imagine the memory of his appearance. The amazing efficacy of patriarchy is that it is a covert operation. It is entre nos, just between us, man and woman, sister and brother, father and daughter, queer and not so queer. It takes place behind closed doors, inside La Hacienda, and back there in the slave quarters. It is so seamlessly woven into the fiber of our lives that to pull at that dangling thread of inequity is to rip open an entire life. If you're familiar with this program, you're familiar with Adrienne Marie Brown. She's been on before, but she was back not long ago for the release of her book, Pleasure Activism. 
There's an us before the wound, there's an us before oppression. And like, to me, pleasure is a way that we tap down into that. I'm like, when I'm having orgasm, I'm not like, slavery, you know, I'm like, <laughs> you might be my slave, but <laughs> you know, like in a good way. Um, it's, it's really about like, oh, I feel very free. To me, the work was about like, how do we remind people that you were free to begin with? You were always free to begin with. For me, I was like, how can I bring like the best feeling when I'm, it's like the best high or the best mushroom or where, you know, you know when you're on, have you maybe done mushrooms? All right, everybody else just get to it. All right, life is short. <laughs> life is short and if they're natural, okay, it's great. My name is Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, I am the author of Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good. Right now, we are sitting in Blue Stockings um, Bookstore, which is forever. I used to live in New York. I lived here for like 10 years. Blue Stockings has always been a beloved bookstore for me. So I'm really excited to get to be here tonight. We're doing our New York premiere <laughs> event for pleasure activism. We have been raised to fear the yes within ourselves, our deepest cravings. But once recognized, those which do not enhance our future lose their power and can be altered. The fear of our desires keeps them suspect and indiscriminately powerful. For to suppress any truth is to give it strength beyond endurance. Audre Lorde's text, The Uses of the Erotic, is a foundational text for pleasure activism. And I feel like what she was saying to us, what she was teaching us so much was, that pleasure and the erotic, the awakening, the erotic awakening, is a way that we actually reclaim our whole selves, our real selves, our true selves. And that once we have had that awakening, we'll no longer settle for self-negation, we'll no longer settle for suffering um, as our way of life. It's like, oh, this is just how it's gotta be because we're black women. I was, you know, I started asking myself, like, how did I unlearn pleasure? Or when did I unlearn pleasure? When I look back, it's like, oh, there's an ancestral unlearning of pleasure, a way that black women on this country have been trained to be in service with our bodies, rather to be in pleasure in our bodies. I realize that we're not the only ones, that almost every human on Earth in some way has been disconnected from their natural relationship to the planet, from their natural relationship to themselves, from our natural relationships to each other. And that pleasure is one of the ways we know, like, oh God, I'm in nature. Oh God, I'm with my lover. Oh God, I'm connected. I'm part of something. I belong. I'm safe. Pleasure lets us know all that, right? So for me, I was just like, it's actually a measure of freedom. It's a way that we say, I have decolonized, I have returned to myself, I have been healing. Our acts against oppression become integral with self, motivated and empowered from within. In touch with the erotic, I become less willing to accept powerlessness or those other supplied states of being which are not native to me, such as resignation, despair, self-effacement, depression, and self-denial, yeah? Yes. Right? Yeah. So Audrey is the bomb.com. <laughs> That's how I feel, I'm like, yeah! Let's just give it up for Audrey Lord real quick. Yeah! I was particularly drawn to the uses of the erotic as a text because it was published August 1978 and I was born September 1978. And so I lived like my whole life like, trying to figure out my relationship to pleasure. And it was like, oh, someone had written a text a month before I was born that was like, boom, here it is. And I'm like, oh, just like I missed it, there might be other people who still are missing it, who are still not getting this. Part of being a survivor myself and part of being in communities with survivors is recognizing that um, even when we get to good, even when we're like, okay, I'm not in total trauma land, there's still a lot of our lives that are like, I have to earn pleasure, I have to earn rest, I have to do more for my community to get something good for myself. That's to me the unnatural mythologies of capitalism. That's what we have bought into together is like, I have to earn education, I have to earn home, I have to earn food. Like no, like I'm a part of a community, that should all be part of what I receive. I also think pleasure is to me at the same level as those things. So like when I'm like, oh, what do I need to survive? And Octavia, you know, showed that over and over again, Octavia Butler in her novels and her work. It's like, what do we actually need to survive? It's not enough to just have food if we're miserable and shelter if we're totally hating each other. There's something else. And almost every text that she has, her characters who are surviving apocalypse have lovers. They have symbiotic communities that are giving and taking care of each other. Um, I think we're the same way, that we have to be doing that as a part of what survival even means. 
and how that connects to political work for me is there's this quote from Grace Lee Boggs, who was one of my mentors, that's transform yourself to transform the world. That every oppression, all these systems, they are constructed inside of us. And when we, when we often, when we start our work, when we get politicized, we're like, <gasps> The bad people are like over over here, and we you know learn we learn our organizing by learning like who can we identify and point to as the causers of harm, and I love what Grace says is like this is our our potential for some radical responsibility is like those front lines are inside of us, and so again it ties in. I'm like oh, if the front line is inside of me for pleasure. Like if I want all black women to be able to access pleasure. Um, it really matters that I'm experiencing pleasure. And actually, that's been an interesting thing as I've been touring this book, is I keep showing up to events, and I'm just like, I'm in a deeply, fully satisfied life, and it shows, and you can feel it, and peep, that's the reflection I keep getting back from people. They're like, wow, it's just amazing to be a brown and black woman and like free about her feelings, and like talks about orgasm and stuff, you know? To me, that is a huge portion now of my political work, is to be a satisfied black woman for people to see that. that I'm like, yes, I get angry, yes, I'm sad, yes, I feel the full range of emotion, but fundamentally, when you ask me, I'm good. I'm good because I made myself good. I made, I'm good because I found the right community to be around me, because I've somehow dodged the bullet of like getting my life tied in with some patriarchal like downfall of man. <laughs> like I'm just like, I'm good, right? I'm happy. And I feel like a lot of people need to witness that um, and, and be that in their own communities. Um, and I do, I like the idea of echo chambers of transformation, right? That it's like, if mine sets off yours, just like mine was set off by someone else, just like someone else helped her. And like, I love that idea that it's like, we just keep popping it off until it becomes the most compelling force. We are so deeply repressed that anyone experiencing even a tiny bit of pleasure, we're like, you a freak, right? <laughs> you know, you guys are laughing so hard. I, I, I'm like, am I on the wrong light? Am I a stand-up comic? I think I might be. While at Blue Stockings, we had a moment to look around. For the past 20 years, this bookstore slash activist center has established itself as a hub of radical thought on the Lower East Side. How can a space run collectively continue to serve an engaged and expanding world into the next 20 years and beyond? We spoke with two volunteers to learn more. Blue Stockings is open from 11 to 11 every day of the week. Some of our bookshelves look like they could be an academic syllabus for the Black Atlantic and queer history. Some of our shelves are full of zines, children's and young adult books. We realize that people encounter radical thought through a variety of ways and that thinking seriously about ideas has always been a part of how we get organized. And our zines are really popular here and I think it's just a really cool mix of having community organizations like the Doula Project, having their practical support zines that are sharing information that people might need to know about their health, to just having a zine full of like weird poems or jokes. So it's, it's a really fun mix and they're a really popular part of what we sell here. We encompass so many different kinds of um, activist strategies. I think mm -hmm. sort of reducing the Blue Stockings to a feminist bookstore maybe does it a disservice because I mean we're we're a feminist bookstore, we're a activist bookstore for sex workers, for trans people, for black and brown folks, for disabled folks, for so many different peoples mm -hmm. that does that encompass feminism? Yes, but mm -hmm. I think it's I don't know, it feels a little homogenizing, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, I know bookstore is in our name, but I think being able to have this community hub for groups across the boroughs really has been a critical part of our work for a very long time. Since our store started in 1999, we have been here on the Lower East Side. And it's precisely in those past two decades that we have seen so many changes in the neighborhood surrounding us. And so the fact that Blue Stockings has managed to stay a strong, powerful bookstore and activist center in this space is really something to celebrate. I think people are surprised when they find out that we stay stable as a bookstore through selling books. Mm -hmm. We don't make our money through selling tote bags or through selling our coffee. And mm -hmm. I think we make a really powerful case for bookstores across the country that people read books and you can sell books and people will come and search for those spaces. I have seen so many of the spaces that are beloved to me close and so many of my loved ones have too. 
the space is important to so many people, to so many of the artists and creators and activists of the city. And to be able to show up for the people who have made the space what it is, we need that stability. We think the best way to be accountable to the communities that come into the space every day is to have community funded grassroots people who can and want to show up to the store in this way, sustaining the store on a base level so that we can have a safety net. If we're always on the defensive and if we're always wondering what's gonna happen if the yoga studio upstairs leaks, if our air conditioner breaks down, we can't do what our communities really need us to do, which is to dream big about how can this space continue to grow? We don't want to stay static. We don't want to do the same thing we've been doing for 20 years. Part of our politics is being able to really dream about and manifest what can the future look like. We're so excited to have so many people here come out for Adrian and Marie Brown and pleasure activism. With the advent of Sesta and Fosta and mm -hmm. with sort of growing movements to sort of censor marginalized people mm -hmm. on the internet, I think it's especially important to have physical spaces that mm -hmm. are making sure that marginalized people feel safer, mm -hmm. that they feel like they have community surrounding them. I think that's what we intend to try and keep doing with our fundraiser, to try and hold space for another 20 years mm -hmm. for all the marginalized people who count on us to be here.